I'm Gary Kaplan. Uh, some of you were here uh, for our last session, uh, but I'm a practicing internist. Uh, I've been at Virginia Mason Medical Center for th in Seattle, Washington for 38 years. <laughs> and over the last uh, uh, 16 years, I've had the privilege of serving as the uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer. Uh, I also have the honor of serving with Derek uh, as the board chair of IHI. And so I wear multiple hats, but today uh, we're sharing, I think, some important lessons that we've learned from our journey at Virginia Mason. That journey has gotten a lot of recognition, but I want to make sure you understand that we are nowhere near where we need to be. I think the thing that has characterized this journey for us is that it's one of continual learning and continuing to evolve. One of the ways I do that is by sharing ideas with my good friend and colleague and thought partner, uh, Jack Silverson. Okay. So yeah, thank you, Gary. So my role here this afternoon is to comment on and try to uh, pull out the principles that Gary will be sharing in terms of what they've actually done at Virginia Mason Medical Center. My background is I was trained as a clinician, actually as a dentist at Harvard many years ago, doctorate in public health, and then a full-time academic for about eight years. But for the last 35, my wife and I have had a consulting business all in healthcare and really targeted toward helping particularly doctors and other clinicians work more effectively together to learn how to collaborate on behalf of better patient care and how to collaborate not just with each other more effectively, but how to collaborate more effectively with the administration in order to improve care. And so the comments that I'll be making are, again, the general principles that hopefully will allow you to take some of what Gary's sharing and take it home and begin to apply it in your own organization. So just curious, how many of you were here at the last session we did? So many of you. So I'm going to apologize in advance. It's the challenge of two sessions. But uh, this first couple of minutes is just to set the context. Just a couple. Just a and um, yeah, just a couple. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, this is Virginia Mason. We're uh, not a giant uh, mega system in the United States, but we are a good size uh, integrated healthcare system. Uh, we were founded by doctors who came in 1920, so 96 years ago, from the Mayo Clinic to found the first group practice in the Pacific Northwest. Today, we actually have two hospitals. Uh, just recently, uh, a, a small hospital in central Washington joined our uh, health system. We're in nine locations. We have 500 physicians, and we have an academic mission to also uh, train um, physicians and nurses and others of the future. We have about 120 of our own residents, uh, junior doctors, and we have a basic science and clinical research enterprise. And then just in recent years, we've created the Virginia Mason Institute that helps us, is the vehicle by which we uh, share our learnings with others from other organizations in the United States and uh, around the world. I know some of you are working uh, with us on some on some projects. Our work has been a real journey. It's not something that um, you know we're done with. It's not something that I can almost say started at a, at a moment in time, but it's really been a progression, building on the foundation of the founders and the people that you know came to Virginia Mason in 1920, started the organization, have continued to evolve. But the work that I think we're most known for is what's happened over the last 15 years, uh, where we have uh, consciously deployed the principles of the Toyota production system as our management system, what we call the Virginia Mason production system. I very rarely use the word lean, and I very rarely use it because I think, to me, it means lean tools. And we use lean tools, and we are very focused on that is a core anchor foundation of the Virginia Mason production system is our use of lean tools. <coughs> but it's been about a lot more than the use of lean tools. And I think that's one of the things we highlighted in the last session, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some components of that work that's helped us uh, make progress in recent years. I have to tell you, we were thrilled 
in the year 2010 when LeapFrog, which, which uh, uh, evaluates uh, health systems on behalf of large employers in the United States, named us one of two hospitals of the decade. What I was most excited about was that it was about quality, but it was also about resource stewardship. And so what it demonstrated is that the pathway to higher quality, safer care can be the same pathway to lower cost. And I think that recognition was very powerful for our team members because it said we're working on the right work and said we need to keep moving forward. But you know, as soon as we got the recognition, it was kind of back to work because we have so much more uh, that needed to happen. And our work is really centered around what we call our strategic plan, which is really a strategic framework that has endured now for the last 15 years. And it starts with the clarity around who is our customer. Our board said to us in the year 2000, I was a brand new, brand new CEO, said, who is your customer? And like everybody in healthcare, we said the patient, and the board said, well, if that were the case, things would not look the way they look. And that was a very dramatic kind of eye opener for us. We didn't understand it at first, and then the more we looked in our own systems and processes, the more we realized they were designed around us, the doctors, the nurses, the managers, and everybody that works in healthcare. And so we began to change our thinking and design care clearly around our patients. Our vision, what do we aspire to be? This took time, it took months, but we said we aspire to be the quality leader, not just in Seattle, but anywhere. And we're, work, we're still working on that, we haven't gotten there. But we said, rather than getting bigger, rather than just grabbing market share, our aspiration needs to be around quality. And so we, our core business strategy has been around quality and safety. And then interestingly, we didn't know how to do that. I mean, we had some ideas and we went looking for a management system and I personally went to some of the great institutions in our country, Harvard, Hopkins, Stanford, great institutions and didn't see anybody using a management method. And that's when we heard from Boeing right down the street in Seattle about the work they were doing with the Toyota production system. And we adopted that as our management system. And uh, that's not the purpose of this talk, but that's kind of where that journey has taken us now. Uh, and it's required much more than attention to lean tools. So the last, thanks Gary, so the last step in orienting people who weren't here before in a quick review for those who were, we're going to be dealing with that one dark circle for the rest of our time together, but just to orient people quickly, in our first session we talked about the foundation for engagement, including the bubbles that are on that diagram. It starts off with a commitment to finding a single method for improvement. It's through having one method, regardless of whatever it is, that will further communication and the spread of positive change in the organization. But we have found that there are many organizations, maybe the majority of organizations still have multiple methods. And we see that as a significant barrier for transformation. The other bubbles there really focus not on the technical aspects of lean tools, but on what I might call the more emotional need to engage people to become a part of the change. We talked in our first session that many of the changes that are involved as you transform care, for, uh, for many people in your organization, and particularly for the clinicians, may really be sufficiently foreign or outside their enculturation to create for them a, a fair amount of psychological pain or asking them to accept a professional identity that might be quite foreign. And so the rest of these bubbles are to help people engage and work through the emotional content of what's required to fully engage in transformation. It starts off with helping people feel the urgency for change. And then we talked about that's really helping people really stay within a dynamic of sufficient anxiety so they do engage, but not so much that they tune out. As they become more 
aware of the urgency for change. We introduced them to becoming a part of developing a shared vision, much like Gary described, something that have, paints a picture of the future state where we can see we will be successful. We will have our ability to if positively affect patients' health and patients' lives um, and have a great place to practice. We talked about, for the end of our time together in the last session, we talked about the role of enhanced clinical leadership to lead and support people through some of these changes. And now we're going to talk about this last section, which is modernizing what we're calling the compact, co-creating a new set of expectations between the front line and management that together when played out, will be, pro provide us with the appropriate behaviors and expectations and accountabilities to take the organization through transformation. So I want to just spend a bit of time defining what I mean by a compact, a little bit about where that comes from, and then Gary will talk about the work that they did to create and then ultimately implement or live into that set of agreements. Okay, so a compact. A compact, the notion of an organizational compact or psychological contract, there is no magic to the words. So if the words bother you, you can call it anything you like. But the concept is something which is real. And this was observed by people out in business before we kind of appropriated the notion into healthcare. And that is, you go into an organization and you quickly learn what is expected of you and what can you expect of the organization? And that's that notion that there, these expectations, though, often just understood and never written down, there is this reciprocity. And when the reciprocity reinforces success, that becomes a way of life. So for example, in America, for many years, the unwritten compact between the organization and those doing the work in the organization was loyalty for job security. Loyal, job for life, everybody successful and happy. And that really worked quite well until maybe the mid to late 1980s in America where loyalty no longer produced competitive products and services. And so that deal that people had committed their lives to changed overnight. And what's interesting is that even though these deals were never written down, people lived their life as if they are commitments. And so when those deals changed, for example, people who had been loyal were laid off as excess employees, they felt quite betrayed because, again, not written down, but deeply held beliefs about this is the way life is going to work in an organization. So when compacts, these unwritten agreements change, people can be quite devastated. Okay, so what's the relevance of all of this to our lives here in healthcare? Well, first of all, I think we have to start off with thinking about what is the relationship between administration or those with more leadership responsibility and the frontline people who are providing the care day to day? And we've described this, I think, as the state in most organizations as two parallel tracks, never the twain shall meet. And one track we have administration, and on the other track we have doctors and probably other clinicians. And, and you, th you think about, okay, they each have traditionally had their own roles. Administration, controlling the operations and the budget, the finance, and the doctors and other clinicians providing the clinical care. But what's interesting is this is not just a separation based on tasks and responsibility. It's also a separation based on culture, tradition, and virtually tribes. We have very little experience in most organizations of really understanding the other's concerns, owning the other's challenges, or feeling responsible for helping the others to solve those challenges. Actually, little experience of collaboration. And while this tradition may have worked for many years, as we try to improve care and come to deeply understand that every clinical decision has financial impact, every financial decision has impact on clinicians, we find that we need to learn to understand our relative roles and how we collaborate to, for better patient care. But I think many of us have to start off by acknowledging we don't have a great quote unquote track record and need to really develop that facility. And I think this compact work is one way toward that end. We've maintained separate realms and the aims don't support alignment critical to improvement. We need to get to a state of greater alignment. Now let's go back, and we won't talk particularly about doctors in this particular part of the program, not because they're special or necessarily more important, but I think, at least in our experience in the United States, and I think in other countries where we've worked as well, the change for the doctors is the greatest because perhaps they have the deepest 
and longest period of socialization. And so their identity about what's appropriate for them as professionals to do is perhaps most developed, and therefore the change for some of this around transformation can be most challenging. So if we look at the doctors and how they become doctors, you think about all the years, the steps, so to speak, that go into that. Um, it takes many years. There's a good deal of delayed gratification, hard work, sacrifice, all of that. But at the end, there is this promise of the light at the end of the tunnel, where society in general traditionally has made a series of promises that have been kept. It would be part of a self-regulated profession. I mean, I can remember way back, and Gary may remember, I know he's reflected on this too, often, at least in our country, you go to become a doctor because you'll never have a boss. No one will tell you what to do. You will have a professional autonomy, self-regulated profession. Clinical autonomy, no one will tell you how to practice. That's your job. You take the responsibility, you have the clinical autonomy. You're going to have job and economic security. People will always get sick. They're going to need your help. Um, and that you're really entitled to have the respect and the status in the community because you, have, you are a healer. And this is the way it was for a long, long time. That societal compact has translated. Now, again, this is more of a US orientation. We've done work in a number of countries uh, outside of the US where this still fits largely, but you have to think about how it might be modified in your own environment. But certainly in the United States, when doctors left training and joined organizations as members of staff, their responsibilities or what they were expected to give would be to treat patients and be good clinicians. But when you go back to the tradition, providing quality care was not defined as something measurable, but more in terms of reputation, where they were trained, observing them, perhaps doing some procedures, but not nearly as quantifiable, and we still have work to do, but not nearly as quantifiable as we can talk about it today. So see patients, be a good doctor. And what the doctors were promised, maybe not in word, but in deed, and if you go back and think about, talk to people who recruited into organizations, the implied promises or that other side of the compact was autonomy, no one will tell you what to do. You will be protected largely from change so that you can be the best clinician you can be, but hiring and firing decisions, training of staff, protected from all that, and you'll have certain entitlements. Perhaps it's parking spaces, perhaps it's patients will be assigned to you, you don't have to go out and seek patients. Um, perhaps it's behavior that you'll be allowed to engage in that others wouldn't be, because we acknowledge you're under tremendous pressure. Whatever those issues might be, this basic deal, most clinicians would acknowledge, certainly from perhaps those clinicians who were, say, 45 or 50 and older, as the deal that existed when they joined organizations earlier in their careers. Now, what we find today, and this is, where, this is critical to understanding the emotional state that needs to be addressed in order to get clinicians to engage with us in transformation. Many of our more senior doctors, perhaps not all the junior doctors, but many of our senior doctors come to us then with light at the end of a tunnel promises or a sense of expectations, legacy expectations. That, and they go like this. Again, the autonomy, no one will tell me how to practice. I will be protected so I can be the best, best clinician I can be, and I'll be entitled to certain things at least, the respect of my patients and of the organization that I, that I choose to be a part of. But now we find, and I think this is true probably for all the countries represented at this great meeting, the imperatives that we are facing as organizational leaders, improving safety and quality, this issue of being really patients at the top, opening up access to get patients who really need to be seen, seen promptly, improving our efficiency, embracing standard work, eliminating non-value-added non uh, variation, all of those things, the imperatives you can see come into direct challenge when you look at the legacy expectations that many of the people currently providing care come along with. And it's this kind of not fitting the expectations with the imperatives that drives us to begin to think about how do we change the compact? Do we need to change the compact? What kinds of discussions will be, will, do, are required? Because what we see in most organizations who avoid that conversation is what I will call a chipping away at the old compact. Not a frank discussion of what worked, what doesn't work, what now new expectations will provide us with a way of working into the future, which will be satisfying for all and help us toward this goal of transformation. 
So over the years, often in organizations, rather than acknowledging this need for a frank and deep conversation about how our working relationship needs to change, we've all observed this increased accountability, more protocols, demands for more standard work. We insist on teamwork, you know, and we put the patient at the top. But no one has fully acknowledged, really, what does this mean to the clinician? So while you might get some passive resistance, sometimes active resistance, some people go right along with it because it seems to them a better way. We're dealing with a myriad, I think, of symptomatology because we haven't necessarily had the real conversation about what's changing and why. And now let's together create an agreement for how we go forward together. So. When I talk about a new compact, what a new compact is, it's clear, it's reciprocal, it's two-sided as you will see. Gary will show you their compact in just a few minutes. It is written down, it is jointly developed. It's the clinicians and its administration together. It's expectations toward a shared vision. Gary talked about the shared vision at Virginia Mason just a few minutes ago. The compact is a means to the end. It describes what can we expect of each other so that we can facilitate getting to that shared vision. So it's all toward execution on the shared vision. It defines the rules of engagement and how we'll treat each other. And then this is the critical part. It becomes the platform for feedback. Frontline to management, Management to front line, front line to front line. We have the ability to communicate, communicate about our expectations because they've been defined. And because they've been defined, we are really, I think, more enabled to give and receive feedback in effective ways. What it isn't, it's not a legal document. It's not. It is, it is, kind, it is not a code of conduct in the traditional sense because it's two-sided, both sides. It's a reciprocal agreement. It's not exhaustive. It's the few things which will really make a difference in getting us toward our, uh, toward our vision. And it is not a vehicle for catching people doing it wrong. It's meant to be a vehicle for coming to some agreement and then helping people be successful at the new behaviors. But it resets the dynamic and hence the reset button. It's everybody changing. This is not about changing the doctors or the clinicians. For every change on the doctor or clinician side, there will be changes on the management side. It's been a relationship. We've enabled each other to be away for so long. Now we all need to acknowledge the need for change. So it's not about getting these other people to change. Again, co-created with management and the doctors or clinicians, and it's widespread engagement. When Gary described the work at Virginia Mason, you will hear it went on for many months, and virtually every clinician was involved. It has to be created within the site. For those of you who are thinking, well, if Gary shows us his, why can't I go back and apply it to my organization? Because if it doesn't come from the bottom up with a lot of dialogue, it will have no relevance. And if it has no relevance, it will produce no change. The shared vision, as I said before, is the foundation for the compact. On one side, what the doctors are going to commit to giving or the clinicians is behaviors that move us toward the vision. And what the organizational leaders will commit to is behaviors that will move the vision, toward, will move toward the vision, and that will support the doctors and other clinicians to keep their commitments. The doctors are right in the front line giving the care, and others are giving them what they need so they can keep those commitments toward moving the organization forward, all supported by the shared vision. I believe this is my last, my last slide. But accountability and compact go hand in hand, and this is the critical part. People listen to this conversation and they look at that beautiful water lily and they say, isn't that lovely? Why can't we just do that? This seems so logical and straightforward. Let's go back and do it. But, they, but they, the real key to all of this is acknowledging that underneath the water, that's the written compact up above the water, but it's living the agreements with accountability. And that's where the work gets challenging and messy. But in the absence of providing feedback, holding both sides to account and making that easy, making people open to hearing it and building that culture of accountability, it becomes just a paper and pencil exercise and actually rather than being effective, will probably produce more cynicism rather than change. So as Gary tells the story at Virginia Mason, I want you to listen for not just what did they do to create it, but perhaps more importantly, what have they done to implement it? Right. So many of us, many know Virginia Mason because of the Virginia Mason production system. But as I said earlier, none of that would have happened if we didn't really feel a sense of urgency, 
have a shared vision and understand that things were not working. And so if you go back to the year 2000, 2001, the old compact, the old deal was alive and well. Now that was the deal that was in place when I joined Virginia Mason. Entitlement, protection, and autonomy. And it was a great deal. It was a really good deal. I was, ent I was entitled to patients because I worked for an organization that had a good reputation, had insurance contracts. I was protected by the business managers and the leaders, physician leaders like I became. And I was autonomous. Only I knew what was best for my patients. The buck stopped with me and only I knew what was best. My father said, go into medicine. Even if you work for an organization, you're gonna be your own boss. And so, you know, that was the deal. And that deal worked pretty well at Virginia Mason for, you know, 50 years or more, maybe 60. And then in the year 2000, as I shared in the last session, we came face to face with some real challenges, economic challenges, challenges around our vision, where were we going? The Institute of Medicine had just put out its To Air as Human report, which talked about you know, 100,000 people up to, turned out to be underestimated, dying in American hospitals. And so it became clear to many of us that that old compact was not gonna allow us to move forward with a new vision and the magnitude of change because we were still very physician oriented. I was proud to say we were a physician driven organization. When I would interview doctors who wanted to come and work potentially at Virginia Mason, I would say, we are a physician driven organization and a special place for doctors. And today I'd be embarrassed to say that. We are a patient driven organization and so being can be a special place for doctors and nurses and pharmacists and everybody who participates in the care process. So we knew the old compact was not working. I was a new CEO. I knew I had to lead change, but I had to be very respectful of the past. Then I heard about this guy, Jack Silverson, who'd been out talking about this notion of a compact that he and his partner, Mary Jane, had seen in the social compact literature and said, there's applications here to what doctors and organizations are going through today. And so one of the first things that happened at Virginia Mason under my leadership, I became the CEO in January of 2000. And in the fall of that year, we had a retreat of all the doctors and the senior executives, senior managers. And the focus of the retreat was to become face to face with, as those of you who were here in the last session, you know that in October of that year, I said, we change or we die. And so how do you come face to face with the notion of change is an imperative and you're living in this environment of the old compact, which is a pretty sweet deal. And so we put together a retreat. That was the major focus. We brought Jack in as our speaker, um, much to my consternation and high anxiety levels. Jack said, well, if I'm gonna do this, I have to go interview doctors in the organization before the retreat. And that was very scary for me, but he did and he learned some things and we went forward with our retreat. And the focus of the retreat was the magnitude of change that needed to occur and the beginnings of the notion of we need a new deal. We have to evolve from a physician-driven, physician-centered organization to one that is different, to one that potentially can be better, but for sure is gonna be different. And so we had that retreat, it was effective, it was actually a source of tremendous um, pain. There was grieving for the past. There were, we had doctors in tears, male and female, in tears 
uh, at this retreat because of the recognition that we needed to change. And it was the beginning of our work uh, to put together our new compact. Now that retreat was in the fall of the year 2000. I had appointed a frontline doctor to help plan that retreat. And little, and she, she was not a real formal leader at the time. And little did she know that after the retreat, I was going to act, ask her to please chair the compact committee. And the compact committee was formed and was a, really led by frontline doctors. I did not want to be on the compact committee. But the wisdom of the group was that if this is really going to be what we learned it needs to be, a reciprocal agreement where the organization commits to things and doctors commit to things, then I had to be there. We had a lawyer, we had our HR person, we had a single public non-executive board member who was the leader of a major company in Seattle, but it was led by frontline doctors. And we began the work of putting together a retreat. And we started with the gives of a compact. And we started with the gives and the gets that had been um, called out in the work at the retreat. And we knew that the compact had to be aligned with our new strategic plan, which had a new vision, which had the patient at the top, which was focused on our driving core purpose around quality. And so we, we saw draft after draft after draft of this retreat, at this compact. And it took months to put together the compact. And it took deep conversations in, with every department. And I would tell you that the compact work touched probably every single doctor in the organization in one way or another. And they would go to all, of, the compact committee would take drafts and they would take it to every site for feedback and input. And they would come to the management committee and get our input. And finally, we reached our final draft. And we put in place our new compact. Now, this is our compact. It's the same compact today that it was in 2001. You can see the organization's responsibilities the physician's responsibilities, a reciprocal mutual agreement. Now, I see a lot of people taking pictures. And people ask me, can we get a copy of your compact? And I say, absolutely, no problem. But it's our compact. And if you really want to engage in this, which we believe is a very foundational process, you have to go through the process yourself. It's the process is actually as important or more important than the actual words on the piece of paper. That said, let me highlight a couple things in our compact. Foster excellence, listen and communicate. Offer opportunities for constructive dialogue. Provide clear compensation. Create an environment that supports teams and individuals. Lead with integrity and accountability. I am held accountable as the CEO for the organization side of the compact. Now our physicians focus on patience, quality, collaborate, treat all members with respect. Now during the conversations, there were several doctors who said, we don't need that in the compact. You know, we know that, of course. And then somebody else in the same room as part of the same dialogue would say, but did you hear what happened uh, in the operating room or in the clinic uh, last week? And they told a story and then it became clear, we actually need to put that in the compact. It needs to be part of our agreement, our responsibilities. And this one's my favorite one. Implement Virginia Mason accepted clinical standards of care. What does that say? That says that if there is evidence or we as a group of clinicians determine and review the evidence, we're actually going to apply that evidence to every patient. Unless, and we know there are good reasons that certain patients 
may have to go off pathway. But what do we really do in most of medicine? We, first of all, we call them guidelines. That's like the, the um, cowardly approach of saying, here's the evidence, but by the way, it's just a guideline. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. You know, our patients don't know that. You know, they don't know that we're approaching it like it's totally optional and any doctor can do anything they want. We're saying this is, there's evidence. And at Virginia Mason, if we agree there's evidence to support a particular clinical standard of care, we're going to apply that unless the patient has a contraindication. And so it's right there. It's in the compact. It's part of our deal when we become doctors of Virginia Mason. So the compact has to connect to the vision. As I mentioned, the discussion is as important as the words on the page. We talk about the compact every week at Virginia Mason. I carry a small laminated copy of the compact in my white coat that reminds me every day of the obligations. And at every professional staff meeting, which we have every month with our doctors, we talk about something on the compact. Might be on the organization's responsibilities. Are we holding up our end of the compact? Are we actually leading with integrity? Are we providing enough opportunities with, for dialogue and input or not? Or we'll ta tackle a, a physician responsibility of the, the compact. We make it come alive and that dialogue helps make the compact real. But then what we do is we use it in recruitment. And so if you are a physician and send a letter, uh, see there's an open position at Virginia Mason and you want to maybe work at Virginia Mason, you send a letter applying, you get a letter back from me. Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, you'll be hearing from our uh, staff, physician staff services office. We'll talk about next steps in the process. Here is a copy of our physician compact. Now, 95% of the time, people say, this is really good. And about 5% of the time, people say, well, I'm not sure I want to work in a place that's that clear. And that's really good, too, because that helps us understand before we waste our time and their time that it's not going to be a good fit. And so we use it in recruiting. We use it in orientation when new people come. We use it in our job descriptions for our leaders and for our physicians. And we use it to provide feedback. So it's not about a carrot and a stick, but all of us work in organizations where we have some people that need some feedback, right? And maybe could improve a little bit and be better team members. And so the compact is a foundation for giving the gift of feedback. And the compact is a foundation for me, in part, in how I receive feedback from the organization, from our doctors, from our other leaders, and from our board. So very, very powerful foundational document, foundational process to everything we've been working hard to accomplish at Virginia Mason. Now our physicians said we have a good compact and our leaders saw this and said we want a compact too. So we went through a process with our leaders. What does every leader have every right to expect from the organization and what does the organization have every right to expect from its leaders? Another eight month process, but a process that was critically important. And so when someone becomes a leader or aspires to be a leader, they know what the deal is. They know what they can expect from the organization and they know what the ex their expectations are of, their, of themselves. And so it's a very, very, very powerful construct for us. Interestingly, after our physician compact and our leadership compact, our public board members said, we want a compact too. We want to understand the organization's obligations to us as board members, and we want to understand our obligations as board members to the organization. And it's really about clarity. 
It's about transparency. It's about being explicit, not having an implicit or underground, more often than not, misunderstanding of what our responsibilities are and what we can expect, the gives and the gets. And I'm going to share with you a, a brief story, and some of you know this story, and it illustrates a lot of what we've been talking about this afternoon, both in our vision around patient-centered, not doctor-centered, around using a method, and about the meaning of compacts and leadership. And so, I'll take you back to 2004, and we put together an RPIW, that's a Rapid Process Improvement Workshop, one of the key improvement vehicles for our Virginia Mason production system work. It's really rapid cycle improvement event. And the purpose of this event was to make flu vaccination clinic more efficient for our patients. So when they came in to the, or to the facility, they can get their flu shot during flu season and go home or go back to work or make it very efficient. So we had a doctor, we had two nurses, we had two medical assistants on the team. One of the things that came out of this workshop, by the way, was drive through flu vaccinations, where you could drive your car up, stick your arm, roll down the window, sign the permit, stick your arm out the window, get your flu shot, and be on your way. One of the improvements. It didn't last long. We did it for about a year. But what came from this event was much more profound. One of the medical assistants during the week took it upon herself to review the medical literature about influenza A. And she came back to the team the next day and she said, do you know that 50% of the people with influenza have no symptoms? Now, I didn't know that, but it turned out to be true that half the people who are actually shedding virus in their environment are either prodromal, they have not yet developed symptoms, but they're already contagious, or they may never develop symptoms and are carriers of the virus during flu season. I thought that was pretty interesting. She went on, though, to say to the team, how can we put the patient at the top if we may be giving people the flu when they come into our facilities. Some of the sickest immunosuppressed people in our community come into our offices and we may be giving them the flu. Shouldn't every staff member at Virginia Mason have a flu shot? So we thought about that for about a minute and we said, absolutely. If you work at Virginia Mason, you will get a flu vaccination. No question. It was the epitome of putting the patient first, that our number one responsibility is to protect our patients. Well, the nurses' union took us to court, and they said, you can't do that. You, you have to bargain that rule. And we said, no, we can do that. And they said, no, you can't. Yes, you can. They won. So then we said, OK, if you are a represented nurse, represented by the union, and you refuse to get a flu shot during flu season, you have to wear a mask from the time you enter the building to the time you leave the building, from you know, October through April. And they said, flu season. They said, well, you can't do that. Yes, we can. No, you can't. They took us to court. We won. And today, and every year since, I need to use a slide because it, it gets even better, 99.9. .9. Everyone who works at Virginia Mason gets a flu shot, except for about three or four represented nurses who wear masks. Now, some people had to leave the organization. Some people were terminated because they refused to get a flu shot. But I knew we were past the tipping point when we were in a meeting like this, a monthly professional staff meeting, and I said, we, we put out the agenda. And if I put, you know, physician compensation on the agenda, I'm going to have a full auditorium. 
If I put quality and safety on the agenda, I'll get, you know, 100 or 150 people instead of 500. I put mandatory flu vaccination on the agenda, and it was standing room only because people thought they were going to get some really good theater. And so we were talking about the new policy, and one of our doctors stood up, and he came from a different country, and he said, I came to America for freedom, and you can't tell me what to put in my body. And I said, I'm thinking, oh, you're right, you know, I can't tell you what to put in my body. You have choices. You can choose not to work here. That's what I'm thinking I'm going to say. But I didn't have to say that because one of our critical care doctors stood up in the auditorium and he pointed his finger at this guy and he said, never again am I going to take care of a patient in the ICU on a ventilator that you may have given the flu to, not in our hospital. And that was the last word we heard about it in 2004. And you know, up until three or four years ago, we were the only hospital in the United States to actually man require mandatory flu vaccination. But it was, it was a time where we were put to the test. Do we really believe what we say we believe? And do we really believe in putting the patient first? And in the compact, do we really have responsibilities and obligations to each other? And what does it really mean to be a physician? at least in our organization, and I hope uh, these kinds of things are helpful as you think about what it means in your organization. So think about your own organization. Think about the unwritten compact that exists, because whether you have a compact or not, there's a deal. There's an implicit deal that people are assuming. And is it working? Is it helping create engagement? Is it supporting change and improvement? Or does it actually get in the way? Is it a reason that people say, no, we can't change? Or can we put in place a process where people begin to come together and agree and make those mutual expectations reciprocal and explicit? And it turns out to be we can make progress. We can redesign care around our patients. And we can become a learning organization and I showed this slide at the last session, but I'll show it again. In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. Think about that. Most of us have been around a long time. We see all kinds of things happening and we figure it out. But it's not about figuring things out. It's about building the capability and the will to lead change in our organizations, no matter what happens in our environment. Our patients and our communities are counting on us. Thank you very much.